The compensation of executives is much larger than that of other employees, is determined by a different set of factors, and also includes both monetary and non-monetary rewards. In addition to their salary, executives also tend to receive a large portion of their total compensation through a bonus program. As their main job is to increase the profitability of the company, their bonuses are usually tied to that profit. In addition, stock options, deferred compensation, non-financial rewards, and director pay can round out an executive's total compensation package. A stock option is the right to buy a company's stock at a predetermined amount at a later date. The predetermined price is the value of the stock on the date that the option is offered, and the later date is usually within the next 10 years. Stock options are usually incorporated into executive compensation programs as the increase in the company's stock price is usually a good indication that the executive is achieving some of their goals. In addition, this compensation is not treated as cash through the company's financial records, and as such is more favorable for the company. A non-qualified deferred compensation plan is any agreement under which compensation earned in one calendar year is paid in a later calendar year. These plans tend to be used as retirement plans for executives and other highly compensated employees. As these plans are non-qualified, that means that the company does not earn certain tax savings for offering these plans. However, they can attract and retain more qualified executives when offering some of them. Withdrawals from a non-qualified deferred compensation plan can occur when the individual no longer works for the company, when the individual becomes disabled, at the individual's death, a specific time listed in the plan, when a change of ownership or control occurs of the company, or an unforeseeable emergency. Non-financial rewards can vary greatly from company to company, as well as within companies. Some of the more typical non-financial rewards are company cars, country club memberships, first class air travel, and home technology. Many executives receive additional compensation for serving on a board of directors for their own corporation or for an outside corporation. Aside from an annual retainer, they may also receive compensation related to each individual meeting they attend. The Davis-Bacon Act, also known as Prevailing Wage Law, covers work on the construction or repair of federal buildings for which the contract involves more than $2,000. It requires organizations holding federal contracts to pay laborers and mechanics the prevailing wages of the locality in which the work is performed, and overtime must be paid at one and one-half times the local rate. The Walsh-Healy Act extended the Davis-Bacon Act to non-construction federal contractors with contracts exceeding $10,000. Here, minimum wage standards are established by the Secretary of Labor rather than local prevailing wages. The Fair Labor Standards Act, also known as Wage and Hour Law, sets minimum wage standards, overtime pay standards, and child labor restrictions. It also outlines the exemptions from minimum wage and overtime that are available to executive employees, administrative employees, professional employees, computer employees, and outside salespersons that perform certain duties and responsibilities. Overtime provisions of the FLSA require that covered employees receive one and one-half times the regular rate of pay for all hours worked in excess of 40 during a given week. If employees receive a straight hourly wage, overtime calculations are quite simple. The calculations are much more complex when overtime involves bonus payments, time off in return for overtime work, and work done on a salary or piece rate basis. The regular work week consists of seven consecutive periods of 24-hour days. An employer may choose any day and hour to begin the work week. Each work week stands alone for purposes of calculating overtime pay. The regular rate of pay includes the basic hourly rate of pay plus any non-discretionary bonuses, shift differentials, production bonuses, and commissions earned. The child labor provisions of the FLSA are designed to protect the educational opportunities of minors and prevent them from working in jobs under conditions detrimental to their health or well-being. Children under the age of 18 are restricted in certain capacities depending on the type of work and the hours of work. The table on this slide explains those restrictions.
The FLSA requires employers to keep records of wages, hours, and other related items. The records do not have to be kept in any particular form and time clocks are not required. Some of the items that are required to be kept are personal information of the employees, total hours worked each work day and each work week, and any and all deductions from or additions to wages. The Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963 as an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act and states, no employer shall discriminate between employees on the basis of sex by paying wages to employees less than the rate at which he pays wages to employees of the opposite sex for equal work on jobs requiring equal skill, effort, and responsibility and similar working conditions. The Equal Pay Act provides four exceptions to the employer's obligations to pay male and female employees the same wages. These are a bona fide seniority system where wages or salaries are based on length of service, a merit pay system where pay is determined by legitimate performance measures, a system that measures earnings by quantity or quality of production, or a differential based on any factor other than gender such as differentials between regular and temporary employees or geographical differences. The federal wage garnishment law restricts the amount of an employee's disposable earnings that can be reduced to pay garnishment. The law limits the amount that can be garnished in one week to not more than 25% of an employee's disposable weekly earnings or the amount that is 30 times the FLSA minimum wage, whichever is less. Independent contractors and employees are two completely separate groups of individuals. It is important to know that they are not interchangeable. For example, a true employee cannot be made into an independent contractor to avoid payroll taxes. The difference between employees and independent contractors is determined by the overall working relationship with the employer. Based on the IRS's criteria, generally speaking, an individual is an employee if the employer controls who performs the job, what it is to be done, with what tools and supplies, how it is to be done, where it is to be done, and when it is to be done.